Welcome to the Consulting Specifying Engineer webcast, Critical Power, Backup, Standby, and Emergency Power in Mission Critical Facilities. Sponsored by ASCO Power Technologies, I'm your moderator, Jack Smith, with Consulting Specifying Engineer, Pure Power, and CFE Media. Here's a list of learning objectives for today's webcast. We'll cover these in today's presentation. Now let's meet today's presenters, Tom Devine and Freddie Padilla. Tom Devine is a senior electrical engineer at Smith Segment Reed in Houston and has spent 16 years in the consulting engineering field with the past 12 years designing and engineering healthcare facilities. He's responsible for power lighting and fire alarm design for hospital and healthcare projects. He has written a number of articles and is a veteran webcast presenter. Tom is currently a member of the Consulting Specifying Engineer Editorial Advisory Board. Freddie Padilla is a principal and senior electrical engineer at Page in Austin, Texas. Freddie has developed significant experience as an engineer designing infrastructure for data centers and has has successfully earned his uptime tier designer's accreditation in 2013. In the past few years, he has been responsible for leading page teams in the electrical design of more than 12 data centers totaling more than $1 billion in construction costs. He is also a member of the Consulting Specifying Engineer Editorial Advisory Board. Thank you, Tom Devine and Freddie Padilla, for joining us today. Tom, you're our first speaker, and the floor is all yours. Thanks, Jack. Today I'll talk about the codes that cover emergency, legally re required standby, and optional standby systems, mostly from the viewpoint of the 2017 edition of the National Electrical Code. I'll touch on uh, those system requirements and how they're different for healthcare, and I'll wrap up with a brief look at the uh, changes to the NEC for 2017. Here's a list of uh, those codes in their most current editions. The National Elect Electrical Code provides a lot of detail about the installation requirements for standby systems. The Life Safety cover Code covers performance requirements. NFPA 110 covers the installation requirements for standby power systems, including sources, some of the distribution and transfer switches. It's worth noting that NFPA 110 covers only installations whose failure could adversely affect the safety of human beings. It excludes other kind of systems. And NFPA 99 covers installation and performance requirements specifically for standby systems in healthcare facilities. I'll look at those codes with a primary focus on the NEC. Uh, here's a list of articles. Uh, in uh, the NEC that show that reflect us, we'll be looking at Article 700, Emergency Systems, 701, Legally Required Standby, 702, Optional Standby, uh, Freddie Padilla will look at Critical Operations Power Systems, and we're not going to look at it here today, but I'm noting that Article 445 affects installations as well. That's about generators. Uh, here are some other uh, codes and articles that affect system design, uh, particularly NFPA 20, the standard uh, for installation of fire pumps, and uh, then two articles from the NEC Healthcare Facilities, Article 517 and uh, 695 fire pumps, which echoes a lot of the requirements from NFPA 20. Now we'll start our look at emergency systems with a look at the three classes of standby systems. Uh, the NEC describes three types for a general facility, that is for a facility that doesn't fall under uh, the requirements of one of the other articles like COPS, Critical Operations Power System, or Healthcare, which would fall under uh, 517. Article 700 covers emergency systems, 701 covers legally required standby systems, and that's a term that we'll define more clearly later and Article 702 covers optional standby systems. And we'll use this diagram to discuss some of the aspects of each of the systems. This is the one-line diagram for a fairly simple hypothetical facility. 
It has emergency loads, legally required standby loads, optional loads, and a COPS area. Emergency is in red, legally required is in orange, optional is in green, COPS is in blue, and normal power is in black. I won't talk about COPS. Freddie will talk about that later. So of the three types of standby systems, the emergency system has the highest priority. Its purpose is mostly protecting people's lives. Here's a snippet of the one-line diagram on the right, enlarged a little bit, showing the normal and standby feeds, the automatic transfer switch, and two levels of distribution. So emergency systems, by definition, are required by law or by a code or by a, an AHJ, and they are specifically classed by that uh, statutory authority as emergency systems. They provide power that's essential for human life. The classic example of emergency load is egress lighting, and that's lighting, say, to illuminate a path to the outside of a building when the normal source of power is not available. Other emergency loads are things like fire alarm, communication systems that you might use to contact uh, emergency services like the fire department, or that uh, provide emergency instructions to the occupants, industrial processes that can't be shut down unexpectedly uh, without some serious danger to people are also considered emergency loads. Some systems that we might intuitively think of as emergency loads aren't, in fact, uh, code-designated emergency loads. Smoke removal systems aren't on the list of emergency loads, and in fact, they're served as legally required standby. Here are some of the requirements for emergency systems. This list covers some of the more interesting requirements. The capacity of the emergency system has to be enough to operate all the loads connected to the system simultaneously. This is a very stringent requirement. It's unlikely that the system will ever have to serve everything that's connected to it at 100% load at the same time. But the nature of an emergency system just demands that it be prepared for whatever is asked of it, so we have this requirement. Uh, the second, the transfer to the standby generation system has to be automatic rather than manual. Uh, the emergency system must supply power to its loads within 10 seconds from the moment that normal power fails. That's a, a very restrictive load, it's, it's, uh, or excuse me, requirement. Normally, uh, you can expect to see power at best within about seven seconds if you're using a diesel generator as the, the standby source. Uh, Article 700 or 700.32 requires that emergency system overcurrent devices be selectively coordinated with all supply side overcurrent protection devices. That means all the breakers and fuses in that system have to be coordinated. And by way of description of selective coordination, uh, in a system that's selectively coordinated, only one overcurrent device will open to clear a fault. And that would be the upstream device that's closest to the fault. That will restrict the outage to only those circuits that absolutely have to be de-energized. Uh, proponents of this requirement argue that selective coordination is necessary, and they argue from a philosophical standpoint, to maintain safety, and opponents of the requirement claim that there's no record of anyone ever being injured uh, by failure of coordination, and that a strong or super commitment to selectivity will drive all of the design decisions about the system uh, to the exclusion of other important factors. Uh, the requirement for selectivity first appeared in the 2005 edition, and since then it's led to a lot of lively discussion. Uh, the requirements got amped up in the, the uh, definition of selective coordination in Article 100 in the 2014 NEC, and they now say that, that full selective coordination is required at all times and for all currents for all the devices upstream in the system. Uh, later, we'll see how this requirement gets modified for healthcare systems. Um, and finally, Article 700 allows us to use a single generator to serve the emergency system along with other loads. If the system does serve other loads, though, it has to have automatic selective uh, load shed to preferentially maintain power to the emergency loads at the expense of other lower priority loads. <clears throat> 
Now, on the emergency system, uh, every panel at every voltage level has to have surge protection. We won't see that for any other type of system um, uh, or any of these three emergency legally required standby or optional loads. Uh, emergency wiring has to be independent from all other wiring. It can't occupy the same raceway or the same enclosure with any other wiring except where it absolutely has to. Uh, the exceptions would be devices with connections to both normal and standby power, like a transfer switch or, say, a dual source light fixture. Article 700.10 also calls for wiring from the emergency uh, generator to the emergency system that is separate from wiring that serves other systems, but it does allow an exception if the uh, transfer switches for, that serve emergency load are served from separate vertical sections in the switchboard or from separate disconnect switches from all the other loads. Now, the diagram at the right shows the generator feed for the hypothetical one line with a single conductor from the generator. Uh, to a standby system wireway and separate disconnects serving the emergency system and the rest of the systems. This requirement appeared first in the 2008 edition. It's usually not enforced retroactively, but it will apply to additions to existing systems. It can make it uh, impossible to add, uh, say, an optional load to an existing switchboard that may uh, not have space except on a section that serves emergency loads. And Article 710D11 requires some form of fire protection for the emergency system in, a, in a certain occupancies, in particular 1,000-person assembly occupancies, high-rise buildings uh, with certain occupancy types, specifically hospitals and educational buildings with more than 300 occupants. Fire protection can be uh, a listed system. It can be a fire barrier. It can be concrete encasement or a, uh, a fire suppression system. And uh, Here's an erratum. The, uh, the slide references 700.8 for the fire protection requirement, but that requirement actually appears in 700.10. The requirement has evolved considerably over the last several editions of the NEC. Uh, in 2002, it covered uh, specific occupancies, and one of the ways to comply was just to have a fully sprinklered building. Uh, over time, the requirement changed from being in a fully sprinkler building to being in a space or area that's protected by a fire suppression system. In the handbook, had warnings that uh, spaces above the ceiling weren't protected unless there were fire sprinklers specifically installed above the ceiling. Later, the handbook dropped that warning and said that circuits installed in a fully sprinkler building were generally adequately protected. But then in 2014, the warning came back and the list of affected occupancies uh, was deleted, so a requirement appeared to, to, to apply to almost everything. Uh, then in 2017, the occupancy list came back and it got bigger to include hospitals and certain educational facilities. Uh, the handbook continues to maintain the warning that the above ceiling spaces aren't protected uh, by sprinklers in the occupied zone. Now, the handbook is not enforceable as code, but its provisions carry a lot of weight with AHJs, so it's certainly likely that a requirement for additional fire protection above ceilings would be enforced. Um, the 2015 edition of the NF of NFPA 99, that's the Healthcare Facilities Code, specifically says that those fire protection requirements don't apply to healthcare facilities. That exemption, though, did not appear in the 2017 edition of the NEC, Article 517, which also covers health care requirements. And instead of abrogating the requirement for health care, hospitals were specifically added to the occupancy list uh, that requires that fire protection. So it is not clear that the exemption from NFPA 99-2015 will ever have any effect. It looks as though we're going to see the requirement for fire protection enforced on hospitals. Next in the big three hierarchy of standby systems is legally required standby, and that's described in Article 701. Here's the expanded diagram of the legally required standby system on the right, uh, showing the normal feed, transfer switch, and a couple of levels of distribution. Legally required standby systems are, as their name says, legally required, 
and specifically classed as legally required systems by law, codes, or an AHJ. They power loads whose loss could create some sort of hazard or hamper rescue efforts, but wouldn't threaten human life directly. Some examples might be smoke removal systems, particularly from atriums, sewage disposal systems, and some specific heating and cooling systems. The capacity of the generation has to be enough to operate all the loads that were intended to operate simultaneously. This is less stringent than the requirement for emergency systems because it allows for some diversity among loads that won't necessarily operate together, maybe like heating and cooling of the same space or elevators with a controller that allows only one cab to run on standby. Uh, the transfer to standby generation has to be automatic, just like emergency loads. Uh, the standby system has to apply power to its loads within 60 seconds of the loss of normal power. That's as contrasted to the emergency system rule where uh, power has to be back on within 10 seconds. Article 701.27 requires selective coordination just like the corresponding requirement for emergency systems. And uh, it also allows using the same generator to serve emergency loads and legally required standby and lower priority loads as well, provided that there's automatic load shed uh, to preserve the, uh, the higher priority loads and drop the lower priority loads. And the priority system, the order is, of course, uh, emergency loads followed by legally required standby and then optional loads. And uh, here's another erratum that should be 701.42, not 701.4b. Legally required standby circuits can run in the same raceway as general wiring. There's uh, no requirement for separation from other wiring, and that's in contrast to the requirements for emergency systems. There's also no requirement that legally required standby circuits occupy separate vertical sections um, of switchboards or switchgear in order to be served from a single generator feeder. That requirement exists for emergency systems, but not for legally required standby. And there's no requirement for surge suppression. Article 701 does require that certain various hazards, and that would be including fire, be considered in the design of the system, but there's no specific requirement for circuit fire protection. Looking briefly at healthcare, legally required standby loads are typically served by the equipment branch. Uh, some examples might be medical air and vacuum, uh, certain exhaust fans, and certain limited heating in places that could get cold enough to ha cause a hazard to patients. There were a number of changes in the 2014 NEC and the 2012 NFPA 99 that affect healthcare requirements for standby power systems, and we will talk about some of those later. Now we'll look at optional system requirements. The code doesn't mention any legal requirement about optional loads in terms of statutes, codes, or the view of an AHJ. And that makes sense given its name. These are optional loads. We would not have to serve them under any circumstances. Uh, optional loads are defined as loads whose loss won't cause a risk to human beings at all. Uh, their loss might make for some discomfort, some economic loss, or inconvenience. And some examples might be um, HVAC in, say, a bank, uh, non-essential Internet servers, or, say, a parking garage gate, not, which, if it failed to operate, would certainly be causing some inconvenience. The capacity of the optional system is required to be what's calculated in accordance with Article 220 of uh, the NEC. Those, uh, that article is the one that governs service entrance calculations. And that's quite a bit less restrictive than the emergency systems requirement of being ready to serve all loads at once. It could wind up being more restrictive in practice than the, the all loads intended to operate at one time rule for legally required standby. Most service entries are sized in accordance with Article 220 have plenty of headroom, so we can expect that the same calculations will lead to, us to generators with some level of extra capacity. The code allows for the optional system capacity to be sized under the all loads intended to be operated at once rule if the transfer switch is made manually rather than automatically or 
if uh, if the system is protected by a load management system that restricts the total load to some level below the generator capacity. And it, in a manual system, it also allows for a user selecting which loads will be energized. Transfer can be either manual or automatic. Uh, there's no particular transfer time specified. And selective coordination is not mentioned in Article 702. It's generally good practice to design for selectivity, but they're certainly not the highly restrictive all upstream devices, all possible fault currents, all possible trip time rules that governs Article 701 and 700. Um, here's another item that mention of load management uh, should be Article 702.5 rather than 701. Optional systems can be run with other wiring, just like legally required standby. There's no requirement for separation for optional systems or legally required standby, and that's in contrast to the requirement for emergency systems. Uh, the NEC, for example, would allow legally required standby wiring and optional wiring in the same raceway, enclosure, or wireway. There's no requirement that uh, the optional standby circuits be served from anything uh, separated from anything in a switchboard or switchgear. And there's no requirement for surge suppression on the panels and no mention at all of fire hazards in Article 702. And in healthcare facilities, optional loads correspond to part of the equipment branch. And some examples might be HVAC in public areas where they wouldn't necessarily affect patient care or maybe corporate data processing functions that aren't necessary to run in, the, uh, in real time. Now we'll look briefly at healthcare and some of the things that are different uh, about hospitals design versus design of emergency systems in, uh, in other types of facilities. There were some major changes in the uh, 2014 uh, code. Prior to 2014, the life safety and critical branches of hospital systems were the emergency system, and as such, they fell under Article 700. Uh, in 2014, Article, 57, or Article 517 amended those requirements a little bit, but not much, uh, until 2014. In 2014, the definition of emergency systems disappeared from Article 517. So the view, is, prevailing view is that hospitals no longer have a defined em emergency system. Uh, the three branches, life safety, critical, and equipment are now considered the essential electrical system with no emergency system defined. And the rise in action for that change looks to be the stringent requirements of Article 700 and 701 with regard to selective coordination. That that requirement gets amplified with each edition of the NEC, and uh, writers in NFPA 99 take the view that selective coordination is just one of the considerations for an appropriate overcurrent uh, protection system design. And too strong a commitment to selectivity could negatively impact issues like the protection function itself and on the arc flash level in hospitals. Um, So the change started in 2012 edition of 1999, and that defined that the required level of selective coordination uh, for faults that is that they persist for a tenth of a second or longer. It required selective coordination for those faults, did not require selective coordination for faults that would get tripped faster than one tenth of a second. Uh, the 2014 NEC, Article 517, was harmonized with those requirements and had the same list listing of requirements. Uh, the 0.1 second rule is much less stringent than the 2014 NEC's uh, definition of selective coordination, the full range of available overcurrents, and all opening times. 517 specifically says that the life safety branch falls under the requirements of Article 700, except where 517 specifically amends them. So the wiring methods of Article 700 apply to the life safety branch, but uh, the requirements for selective coordination, which are amended by 517, don't. It looks like the fire protection requirements, the fire protection requirements of Article 700, which specifically apply to hospitals, uh, will be enforceable on the life safety branch. Uh, 
2015 NFPA 9D9, the Healthcare Facilities Code, says that those fire protection requirements don't apply to hospitals. And let me repeat that. The 2015 version of NFPA 99 specifically exempts hospitals from fire protection requirements for feeders. 2017 NEC specifically adds hospitals to the fire protection for feeders, and Article 517 does not address it. Uh, there's been a bit of an ongoing battle between the writers of NFPA 99 and the writers of Article 700 in the NEC for a couple of cycles now. As the NEC describes more restrictive requirements, and NFPA 99 says they don't apply to hospitals. Uh, this one, I think the fire protection will probably apply. And finally, we'll look at the... Uh, well, let me go back. Let me back up one. So hospitals no longer have an emergency system. The life safety system generally falls under 700, except where 517 says something else. And it's worth noting that AHJs might take different views about whether the critical branch falls under Article 700 as well. The definition of an emergency system, things that serve functions whose loss could present a danger to human life, certainly applies to at least parts of the critical branch. So it's possible that an AHJ may uh, declare the critical branch as a de facto emergency system and try to enforce those requirements on it. And finally, we will look at uh, the, the changes in the 2017 NEC as regards to Article 700, 701, 702, and a brief look at 708. Uh, there aren't many, and they don't have a particularly large impact on the installation. 701 and 70, or 700.3 and 701.3 require maintenance in accordance with the manufacturer's instructions and uh, industry standards. Uh, nothing new about that. 700.6, 701.6, 702.6 call for a signal telling uh, that the system has malfunctioned. Now, for years, for, for many cycles, that signal called for uh, to indicate the derangement of the emergency system. Uh, since then, they've changed it to malfunction, and I see that as a good thing because we often wondered what derangement meant in this context. 701, um, 10, and 12 expanded the occupancy list for the fire protection requirement in, uh, and added hospitals and certain educational facilities. 700.10 calls for protecting feeders. 700.12 calls for protecting the room in which the uh, emergency source, the generators, are. Uh, there's a requirement that short circuit ratings be marked on the, uh, the enclosure of transfer equipment new to this code. And finally, in 708, there's a requirement, uh, and that covers critical operations power systems, or COPS, there's a requirement that um, an illuminated indication show that power is available on standard 120-volt receptacles on uh, standby systems. So that summarizes the changes. Uh, not too much, really. Of these, the most important looks to be the fire protection requirements for emergency feeders in most, in, uh, that they apply to more kinds of facilities. That ends my part of this presentation. I'm going to turn it over to Freddie Padilla to talk about uh, mission critical facilities and critical operations power systems. Okay. Uh, hi, this is Freddie. Uh, basically, we're going to be talking about what to consider for mission critical, mission critical projects. Uh, basically, it's a little bit different for mission critical jobs. Emergency generator system requirements shall be considered early in the project. Basically, it's important to know how you're going to handle your generators and what are you going to do with your building. Some of the mission critical jobs, they are basically big, large, single story buildings that doesn't require any emergency loads, or those emergency loads can be covered with batteries. So you don't definitely have to comply with uh, with 700, 701, and 702 for, for many of the mission critical facilities using, uh, with that emergency generator, you will have to do it with other methods. Uh, for, it's also important to mention that for 708, uh, basically, you don't have to comply, when you're using 708, you don't have to comply with 700, 701, 
and 7.2, you can actually follow, comply with 708 and don't comply with the other three. You can also take care of the emergency loads with batteries because the concept with a reliable system is to make sure that your uptime is high. So there is other ways that we will discuss in a little bit to achieve that. Uh, emergency generator system requirements uh, also. It's important to talk about the how do you operate a, a generator on a mission critical project. Basically, you want redundancy on this project. So basically the idea is to have multiple generators in line before you transfer to the load. So that kind of is a little bit, kind of complicate a little bit the process of trying to do it in seven seconds because you're not have, you, you just don't want to have one unit. You want to have multiple units online before you, you drop your load. Of course, that generates the, the, a, new, a new issue, which is trying to keep that load running without uh, having generators on it, with, without having any power. That's why in many of these projects you will see UPSs, uh, rotary devices, Anything that will keep that, that low 30, 20, one minute, five minutes, 10 minutes, even up to 15 minutes, uh, I even heard up to two hours. So you ensure that your generators are, are on. So it's a little bit different approach. Uh, so basically, the, and it's also important to, to say that in, in the mission critical world, you wanna eliminate components as much, as much as you can. So the, the less components you have, the more reliable you get. So sometimes, not complying, removing the requirement to comply with 700 will allow you to eliminate a lot of, uh, a lot of, a lot of components, making your system more reliable. It's not about getting it on faster, it's about making it more reliable. Okay, so, it's important to say that when you're in 700, I believe it was even one of the questions uh, about ground fault protection, uh, that you need to coordinate your ground fault protection. So you have, if you use ground fault protection, you have to make sure that it is coordinated and it's actually selectively coordinated. I mean, you're, you know, you start with your 1200 and then you go up to 1800 and so on to make sure that, that it is coordinated. Uh, but if you're not using 700, this coordination is not required. So you don't even, sometimes you don't even have to have ground fault. And it's, it's many preferences of some people of simplify, eliminate components. So sometimes the idea of mission critical is just to have what is bare minimum. If it's not required, don't provide it. That creates issues. Uh, if you get a ground fault, you might treat a break it upstream when you don't want to, but you control that that issue with uh, having pretty much all three phase loads and procedures and other ways to take care of that. It's also important to say that if you're doing mission critical jobs, you don't need to have UL2200 on your engine. That's an optional thing. You can have it, but you don't need to. Uh, it's just a nice to have. So, Things that you should watch out if you don't want your plant to comply with, uh, with 700 on a mission critical job, you should make sure you put uh, a UL924 UL listed UPS. Uh, you make sure that you provide batteries for your fire alarm. Uh, make sure that you're, if you have an elevator that is either hydraulic or it's got a battery backup on it. There is many elevators out, out there now that you can provide battery backup as an option. So that means you don't, you don't need to have comply with any C700. It's interesting how do we work around this. The concept is not to comply with a section or not to use that section or, or not to make our generators follow that section, which is an interesting thought, a little bit different from, uh, from what we've seen. Okay, so basically now we're gonna talk a little bit about COPS. Uh, these, are, these facilities are facilities that the, the government decide one way or another that they're critical for the operation of, the, of this country, basically. 
And it's kind of interesting, it's important that what we have learned with this, it's important that at the time that the project is being created, even when the bond, when the city or the state or whoever is going to issue the bond, that, that is a, the, the facility is aware early in the stages that it's going to be a cup facility or it's going to have a cup portion because that's usually something that we have learned that if you don't, if you don't make the decision early in the process, even before you uh, go for funding, you might find out that the, it's going to increase the cost significantly just to try to comply and try to make this facility, you know, mission critical, trying to make sure that the facility doesn't have any single point of failure or, or this area doesn't have those. So it's, it's very interesting. So usually what we, what we have seen and, and in, in the industry is that the either fire marshal, city council, uh, these people are making the decision of why and how this facility is. The code does make reference to a couple of facilities like a police stations and so on, but there is a lot of facilities out there in the government, and many of them do require to be caught, and, and, and the decision is, being, is made, and sometimes won't have to be reissued just because of uh, the fact that, they, that this was not thought early in the process. One thing that, they, that you get out of, the, out of this is that you, the first thing that you should do when you're doing a, when you get into a job like this, let's say it was already decided, you went and, and start the process of designing this, this facility, the first thing you try to do is you try to assess your, your risk. So you want to make sure that you identify what, which ones are your, your risk. So you need to make sure that the ASJ agree with your design concept. There is many ways to do this out there that will comply with 708. So I will, will definitely advise to have early meetings with, the, with your ASJ, your fire marshal, your city reviewer, so you make sure that the concept that you guys are using is, is an approved concept. Especially if you're not using ATSs and you want to use a 2N system, because now the, the 2N system overall becomes your ATS and it, it, it's kind of tricky. We need to make sure that your ASJ is on board with that. Uh, it's also important that with, to explain this ASJ that you're trying to minimize uh, human cost events, that is the trick, that's the interpretation, that's why you ended up creating a 2 end design, that's why you ended up having, uh, taking that two courts closer to your load, uh, so it is important. It's also important to coordinate with other trades regarding your risk analysis. We have learned many things, you know, what kind of protection you're gonna have on your building, how are you gonna protect your generator, should they go inside the building, what about your cooling, should it go, your cooling towers, or do you wanna use air cool chillers so they go inside the building so they're protected against uh, natural disasters, especially if your facility have to do with natural disaster or trying to cover that. You have to figure out what kind of facility you're doing and then when is the facility going to be used the most, and then you should make sure that your design correlates with that need. It is really important, and you got to do it early in the process. Commissioning. Well, many times the commissioning for facilities is just to prove performance. Uh, and, uh, of the system, but when you're doing a cost facility, your commissioning is just not, it's not just to prove performance, it's to ensure reliability. So you gotta sit down with your client, you gotta sit down with your, with, with the people that you're working and ensure that whenever they prepare that commissioning plan, reliability is considered for this. Okay? So that's kind of really important. It's also important on this kind of facility to record all the activities. That way you can use that to troubleshoot in the future and as a baseline for you to see what happened when, when this event occurred. Because many of these facilities that, that are cops, what we have learned is that they get used to their maximum capacity only when the event that they intended to be happened. In, I give you a few examples. You know, a, a tornado, a, a thunder, a storm 
like Katrina, uh, any of those big events are the ones that force these facilities to, to go to high alert and to actually be used at a full capacity. So it's important that you commission the building at that capacity so when that, when that particular situation comes, you have backup and you can work with it. Let's talk a little bit about wiring and equipment. I think this is very important. Uh, one of the things that, that we learned, that we have been learning on with this 708 is that it's a good idea to run feeders on the ground because that allows you to keep your, your feeders protected. Many of those feeders uh, can, will have to be fire rated uh, per any NEC 708.10 C2. And if you run them on the ground, you will be able to find some good cost savings. So that's just a recommendation out there, something that we have learned uh, for that. Uh, also, the design criteria operation area is important that that area is defined. COPS is actually defined what is the COP area on the building. So you need to go early with that ASJ and decide what area is the area that is covered by that that is critical. That is the area that is critical. You have to define it. This will definitely help reduce, reduce the cost of the project. If you define that pretty well, you will be able to reduce the cost. Please, do, you know, make sure you, there is some areas that you don't have to include. A couple of tips on that. You don't need to have the break room. You don't need to have lobbies. Any of that stuff do not need to, don't need to be part of the DCOA. If you plan your facility you know, properly, you're not going to have this issue. You will be able to remove those areas and create two areas, the critical area and the non-critical area. That's a good advice. Uh, it's also important to discuss communication wiring and how you're going to protect that wire. For cost facility, NEC 708.14 asks that the communication wire should be, protect, should be protected and should be fire rated. That is a significant amount of cost and it needs to be discussed early in the process. And if that's the case, consider going on the ground with some of those wires. That way you will be able to protect it. Overcurrent protection, this is a good subject. Uh, ground floor protection shall be provided at multiple levels to ensure system coordination. This is different from any other one. Yes, on COPS, you have to provide ground floor protection to ensure that one breaker, one a fault do not trip a main, that your branch circuit will trip first, or your feeder will trip first. I'm sorry, I used the word branch circuit, that is incorrect. It will be your main or your feeder. Branch circuit, you don't, you don't have to provide it. It's not the feeder level. Uh, selective breaker coordination. It also should be discussed early in the in the process. I I've seen I've seen many questions about that about if you have to do selective uh, breaker coordination on 501 uh, for a hospital in a different kind of building and so on. No, and the selective selective breaker coordination is only for the emergency circuit and where, wherever it's described on the on the code, uh, like on 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 hospital on 507, I believe. Uh, so if it's not one of those, you don't, you don't have to do it. So you have to agree and see what you want to do. In the case of COPS, it is required 708.54, you have to provide selective coordination. And it's important to agree at what level. If we don't, COPS doesn't follow 99, COPS just tell you that they need to be required. So agreeing to a level of coordination early in the process will definitely help you define a good budget. If they require to have 100% coordination, the SJ, then you need to be prepared because that will be a big impact on your budget and you probably have to end up oversizing breakers to take care of that. It's not impossible, it just requires more separation in between breaker sizes and each level. Thank you, Tom, and thank you, Freddie, for that first-rate presentation. It's really great, good topic. Now our presenters will answer questions about the topic. Okay, let's get to some of those questions. Uh, we'll get to as many as we can. 
Uh, so, Tom, let's, why don't you take the first question, and, uh, which is, please describe generator and system sizing calculations, demand factors, and load diversity for emergency, legally required standby, optional standby, and COPS. Uh, that's just a little bit of a tall order there. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jack. Um, well, for emergency systems, the requirement reads pretty specifically that uh, the capacity will be suitable to serve all loads simultaneously, all loads to be operated simultaneously is the actual wording. Uh, there may be a little bit of room for interpretation in that, but I have seen it interpreted to mean that it's the NEC calculated connected load with no diversity factors applied. Uh, so emergency is intended, uh, as I understand it, and as I've seen it enforced, has to serve everything connected to it all at once. Uh, for legally required standby, the language is um, all loads intended to be operated at the same time. Uh, with automatic transfer, that would mean that everything that, that can be expected to operate at one time has to be, uh, there has to be adequate capacity for it. And that leaves a lot of room for interpretation. Um, for optional loads, the requirement is to uh, calculate it in accordance with Article 220, the same way we do service entrance calculations, in which case the standard NEC diversity factors would apply. Uh, for COPS, I'll tell you, I don't re don't recall it. I can pass that to Freddie. Sorry. Uh, yes, uh, for COPS, uh, basically the concept is to keep the load running and is to make sure that it's 24-7 or when it's actually needed. So basically, there is no time uh, requirement for it. You just have to make sure that your load is 24-7 running most of the time. So in this case, you will have like a UPS connected in between your load and your generator to ensure that the load do not, is not lost during that process. So it's a little bit different. Okay, Freddie, uh, I'm going to shoot the next question over to you. Uh, what is the trade-off between uh, rotary UPS and battery backup okay basically the is that both of them are serve the same purpose it's just to ensure that the load is not do not lose, lose power at any time so it's a big difference between the two usually it's in the amount of time that you can actually that this system get implemented a UPS uh, usually use batteries and the batteries these days they can they can last from one minute to actually two hours, three hours, as many as you can put in. A uh, 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 rotary UPS, in theory, can do the same thing, but because you're using a, a big mass, uh, usually you can you what you're seeing these days on on rotary that you can do thirty seconds, one minute. Some, some rotary UPSs I've seen on even on two, three, four minutes, but because the amount of mass that is required to, to be able to keep that flywheel or that device rotating is so large, usually the time that you need is, is the, the, the time that you get out of them is a lot smaller than what you can get out of batteries. But basically that's the big difference between the two. Okay, it looks like we have time for one more question, and Tom, you get it. Okay, okay. Uh, it's kind of like a two-part question here. What are the changes in the 2017 NEC related to critical power emergency backup systems, and how do I meet the new 700.3F requirements regarding permanent connection slash switching means for a temporary alternate power source. I can go through that again if you want. No, I've got it. Thanks, Jack. Um, the changes to the NEC 2017, we went through a list of those. I can see that I actually did miss the 700.3F um, 
which is a then 700.3f requires that I have a permanent method of connecting a temporary generator to serve uh, standby power in the event that something bad happened to my permanently mounted generator. Uh, so that would really mean the way that I typically meet that requirement, and we've been doing it for a long time, is to install a uh, an outdoor disconnect switch, maybe fused, usually Kirk key interlocked or somehow mechanically interlocked with the breaker, the generator breaker, and uh, uh, and use that as a place to attach an, a temporary roll-up generator, a rental unit that might be on the back of a truck. Uh, we also use that for load bank testing at the same time. Um, let's see, the next part of that question, that, uh, that would be how do I, uh, well, that's it. We did answer the question. So that's my answer. Jack, we've talked about those minor changes, and then uh, temporary connection would be on an outdoor disconnect. Right. Nailed it. Good answer. <laughs> uh, I'd like to close by thanking our great speakers, Tom Devine and Freddie Padilla, for kindly sharing their time, knowledge, and expertise. I'd also uh, like to extend a special thank you to our sponsors, ASCO Power Technologies, and finally, on behalf of Consulting Specifying Engineer, Pure Power, and CFE Media, thanks for attending. <laughs>